Chapter 5. Several adventures that happen to the author. The execution of a criminal. The author shows his skill in navigation. I should have lived happily enough in that country if my littleness had not exposed me to several ridiculous and troublesome accidents, some of which I shall venture to relate. Glumdalclitch's Glumdalclitch often carried me into the gardens of the court in my smaller box, and would sometimes take me out of it and hold me in her hand, or set me down to walk. I remember, before the dwarf left the queen, he followed us one day into those gardens, and my nurse, having set me down, he and I being close together, near some dwarf apple trees, I must needs show my wit by a silly allusion between him and the trees, which happened to hold in their language as it does in ours, whereupon the malicious rogue, watching his opportunity, when I was walking under one of them, shook it directly over my head, by which a dozen apples, each of them near as large as a bristol barrel, came tumbling about my ears. One of them hit me on the back as I chanced to stoop, and knocked me down flat on my face. But I received no other hurt, and the dwarf was pardoned at my desire, because I had given the provocation. Another day, Glumdalclitch left me on a smooth glass plot to divert myself, while she walked at some distance with her governess. In the meantime, there suddenly fell such a violent shower of hail that I was immediately by the force of it struck to the ground, and when I was down, the hailstones gave me such cruel bangs all over the body as if I had been pelted with tennis balls. However, I made a shift to creep on all fours and shelter myself by lying flat on my face on the lee side of a border of a lemon time, but so bruised from head to foot that I could not go abroad in ten, day in ten days. Neither is this at all to be wondered at, because nature, in that country, observing the same proportion, though all her operations, through all her operations, a hailstone is near 1,800 times as large as one in Europe, which, which I can assert upon experience, having been so curious as to weigh and measure them. But a more dangerous accident happened to me in the same garden when my little nurse, believing she had put me in a secure place, which I often entreated her to do, that I might enjoy my own thoughts, and having left my box at home to avoid the trouble of carrying it, went to another part of the garden with her governess and some ladies or acquaintance. While she was absent and out of hearing, a small white spaniel that belonged to one of the chief gardeners, having got by accident into the garden, happened to range near the place where I lay. The dog, following the scent, came directly up, taking me in his mouth, ran straight to his master, wagging his tail, and set me gently on the ground. By good fortune he had been so well taught that I was carried between his teeth without the least hurt, or even tearing my clothes. But the poor gardener, who knew me well and had a great kindness for me, was in a terrible fright. He gently took me up in both his hands and asked me how I, how di how I did. But I was so amazed and out of breath that I could not speak a word. In a few minutes I came to myself, and he carried me safe to my little nurse, who, by this time, had returned to the place where she had left me, and was in cruel agonies when I did not appear, nor answer when she called. She severely reprimanded the gardener on account of his dog, but the thing was hushed up and never known at court, for the girl was afraid of the queen's anger, and truly, as to myself, I thought it would not be for my reputation that such a story should go about. This accident absolutely determined Glumdalclitch never to trust me abroad for the future for the future out of her sight. I had been long afraid of this resolution, and therefore concealed from her some little unlucky adventures that had happened in those times when I was left by myself. Once a kite hovering over the garden made a stoop at me, swoop at me, and if I had not resolutely drawn my hanger and run under a thick esp espalier, he would have certainly carried me away in his talons. Another time, walking to the top of a fresh molehill, I fell to my neck in the hole, though through which that animal had cast up the earth and coined some lie, not worth remembering to excuse myself for spoiling my clothes. I likewise broke my right shin against the shell of a snail, which happened to I happened to stumble over as I was walking alone and thinking on poor England. I cannot tell whether I was more pleased or mortified to observe in those solitary walks that the smaller birds did not appear to be at all afraid of me, but would hop about within a yard's distance, looking for worms and other food, with as much indifference and security as if no creature at all were near them. 
I remember a thrush had the confidence to snatch out of my hand with his bill a piece of cake that Glumdalclitch had just given me for my breakfast. When I attempted to catch any of those birds, they would boldly turn against me, endeavouring to peck my fingers, which I durst not venture within their reach, and then they would hop back, unconcerned, to hunt for worms or snails, as they did before. But one day I took up a thick cudgel and threw it with all my strength, so luckily, at a linnet, that I knocked him down and seized him by the neck with both my hands, ran with him in triumph to my nurse. However, the bird, who had only been stunned, recovered himself, gave me so many boxes with his wings on both sides of my head and body, that though I held him at arm's length and was out of the reach of his claws, that I was twenty times thinking to let him go. But I was soon relieved by one of our servants, who wrung off the bird's neck, and I had him next day for dinner by the queen's command. This linnet, as near as I can remember, seemed to be somewhat larger than an English swan. The maids of honour often invited Glumdeglitch to their apartments and desired she would bring me along with her on purpose to have pleasure of seeing and touching me. They would often strip me naked from top, top to toe and lay me at full length in their bosoms, wherewith I was much disgusted, because, to say the truth, a very offensive smell came from their skins, which I do not mention, or intend to, to the disadvantage of those excellent ladies, for which I have all manner of respect, but I conceived that my sense was more acute in proportion to my littleness than to the illustrious persons were no more dis disagreeable to their lovers or to each other than people of the same quality are of, with us in England. And, after all, I found their natural smell was much more supportable than when they used, when they used perfumes, under which I immediately swooned away. I cannot forget an intimate friend of mine in Lilliput took the freedom in a warm day when I had, when I had had used a good deal of exercise to complain of a strong smell about me, though as I am a little faulty that way as most of my sex, but I supposed his faculty of smelling was as nice with regard to me as mine was, was to that of the, these this people. Upon this point I cannot forbear doing justice to the queen, my mistress, and Glumdeclitch, my nurse, whose persons were as sweet as those of any lady in England. That which gave me the most uneasiness amongst these maids of honour, when my nurse carried me to visit them, was to see them use me without any manner of ceremony, like a creature who had no sort of consequence, for they would strip themselves to the skin and put on their smocks in my presence, while I was placed on their toilet, directly before their naked bodies, which, I am sure to me, was far from being a tempting sight, or from giving me any other emotions than those of horror and disgust, their skin appeared so coarse and uneven, so variously co coloured, when I saw them near, with a mole here and there as broad as a trencher, and hairs hanging from it thicker than pack threads, to say nothing farther concerning the rest of their persons. Neither did they at all scruple, while I was by, to discharge what they had drank, to the quantity of at least two hogsheads in a vessel that held above three tons. The handsomest among these maids of honour, a pleasant, flocksome girl of sixteen, would sometimes set me astride upon one of her nipples, with many other tricks, where, where it, wherein the reader will excuse me for not being over-particular. But I was so much displeased that I entreated Glumdeclitch to contrive some excuse for not seeing that young lady any more. One day a young gentleman, who was nephew to the nurse's governess, came and pressed them both, both pressed them both to see an execution. It was of a man who had murdered one of that gentleman's intimate acquaintance. Glumdeclitch was prevailed on to be the company very much against her inclination, for she was naturally tender-hearted, and, as for myself, though I abhorred such kind of spectacles, yet my curiosity tempted me to see something that I thought must be extraordinary. The malefactor was fixed in a chair upon a scaffold erected for that purpose, and his head cut off at one blow with a sword of about forty feet long. The veins and arteries spouted up with such a prodigious quantity of blood, and so high in the air, that the great Jean de Hue at the Versailles was not equal to it for the time it lasted, and the head, when it fell on the scaffold floor, gave such a bounce as made me start, although I was at least half in an English mild, mild distance. The queen, who often used to hear me talk of my sea voyages, and took all occasions to divert me when I was melancholy, asked me whether I understood how to handle a sail or an oar, and whether to be a little 
whether a little exercise of rowing might not be convenient for my health. I answered that I understood both very well, for although my proper employment had been to be surgeon or doctor to the ship, yet often upon a pinch I was forced to work like a common mariner. But I could not see how this could be done in their country, where the smallest wherry was as equal to a first-rate man-of-war amongst us, and such a boat as I could manage would never live in any of, the, in any of their rivers. Her Majesty said, said, if I would contrive a boat, her own joiner should make it, and she would provide a place for me to sail in. The fellow was an ingenuous workman, and by my instruction in ten days finished a pleasure boat with, with all its tackling, ably, able convenient, conveniently to hold eight Europeans. When it was finished, the queen was so delighted that she ran with it in her lap to the king, who ordered it to be put into a cistern full of water, with me in it by way of trial, where I could not where I could not manage my two skulls, where where could where I could not manage my two skulls or little oars for want of room. But the queen had before contrived another project. She ordered the joiner to make a wooden trough of three hundred and feet lo long, fifty broad and eight deep, which, by being well pitched to prevent leaking, was placed on the floor along the wall in an outer room of the palace. It had a cock near the bottom to let out, out the water, and when it began to grow stale, and the two servants would e could easily fill it in half an hour. Here I often used to row for my own diversion, as well as that of the queen and her ladies, who thought themselves well entertained with my skill and agility. Sometimes I would put up my sail, and then my business was only, only to steer, while the ladies gave me a gale with their fans. And, when they were weary, some of their pages would blow my sail forward with their breath, while I showed my art by steering starboard or larboard as I pleased. When I had done, Glumdalclitch always carried me back, carried my back my boat into her closet, and hung it on a nail to dry. In this exercise, I once met an, met an accident which had like to have cost me my life, for, one of the pages having put my boat into the trough, the governess who attended Glumdalclitch very officiously lifted me up to place me in the boat, but I happened to slip through her fingers, and should infallibly have fallen down forty feet upon the ground if, by the luckiest chance in the world, I had not been, I had not, I had not been stopped by a corking pin that stuck in the good gentleman's stomach, the head of the pin passing between my shirt and the waistband of my breeches, and thus I was held by the middle, by the middle in the air, till Glumdalclitch ran to my relief. Another time, one of the servants, whose office it was to fill my trough every third day with fresh water, was so careless as to let a huge frog, not perceiving it, slip out of his pail. The frog lay concealed till I, put, I was put in my boat, but then, seeing a resting place, climbed up and made it lean so much to one side that I was forced to balance it with all my weight on the other to prevent overturning. When the frog was got in, it hopped at one once at once half the length of the boat, and then over my head, backwards and forwards, daubing my face and clothes with its odious slime. The largeness of its features made it appear the most deformed animal that can be conceived. However, I desire, desired Glumdalclitch to let me deal with it alone. I banged it a good while with one of my skulls, and at last forced it to leap out of the boat. But the greatest danger I ever, went, ever underwent in the king, that kingdom was from a monkey who belonged to one of the clerks in the kitchen. Glumdalclitch had locked me up in her closet while she went somewhere upon business or a visit. The weather being very warm, the closet window was left open, as well as the windows and the door of my bigger, bigger box, in which I usually lived because of its large largeness and conveniency. As I sat quietly meditating at my table, I heard something bounce in at the closet window and skip about from one side to the other, whereat, although I was much alarmed, yet I ventured to look out, but not stirring from my seat, and then I saw this frolicsome animal frisking and leaping up and down till at last she, he came to my box, which he seemed to view with great pleasure and curiosity, peeping in at the door and every window. I retreated to the farthest corner of my room, or box, but the monkey, looking in at every side, put me in such a fright that I wanted presence of mind to conceal myself under the bed, as I might have easily done. After some time spent in peeping, grinning, and chattering, he at last espied me, and reached one of his paws in at the door, as a cat does when she plays with a mouse. Although I often shifted places to avoid him, he 
that he at length seized the lappet of my coat, which being made of that country silk was very thick and strong, and dragged me out. He took me up by his right forefoot, and held me as a nurse does a child she is going to suckle, just as if I have seen the same sort of creature do with a kitten in Europe. And when I offered to struggle, he squeezed me so hard that I thought it more prudent to submit. I have good reason to believe that he took me for a young one of his own species, by his own his often stroking my face very gently with his other paw. In these diversions he was interrupted by a noise at the closet door, as if somebody were opening it, whereupon he suddenly leaped up to the window at which he had come in, and thence upon the leads and gutters, walking upon three legs and holding me in the fourth, till he clambered up to a roof that I was that was next to ours. I heard Glumdeklitch give a shriek at the moment at the moment he was carrying me out. The poor girl was almost distracted. That quarter of the palace was all in an uproar. The servants ran for ladders. The monkey was seen by hundreds in the court, sitting upon the ridge of a building, holding me like a baby in one of his forearms, and feeding me with the other, by cramming into my mouth some victuals he had squeezed out of the bag on one side of his chaps, and patting me patting me when I would not eat, where, whereat many of the rabble below could not forbear laughing, neither do I think they justly ought to be blamed, for, without question, the sight was ridiculous enough to, to every body but myself. Some of the people threw up stones, hoping to drive the monkey down, but this was strictly forbidden, or else very probably my brains would have been dashed out. The ladders were now applied, and mounted by several men, which, the monkey observing, and finding himself almost in compass, not being able to make speed enough at with his three legs, let me drop on the ridge tile, and made his escape. Here I sat for some time, five hundred yards from the ground, expecting every moment to be blown down by the wind, or to fall by my own giddiness, and come tumbling over and over from the ridge to the eaves. But an honest lad, one of my nurse's footmen, climbed up, and putting me into his breeches pocket, brought me down safe. I was almost choked with the filthy stuff the monkey had crammed down my throat, but my dear little nurse picked it out of my mouth with a small needle, and then I fell a-vomiting, which gave me great relief. Yet I was so weak and bruised in the sides with the squeezes he'd given me by this odious animal that I was forced to keep my, keep my bed at a, a fortnight. The king, queen, and all the court sent every day to inquire after my health, and her majesty made me several visits during my sickness. The monkey was killed, and an order made that no such animal should be kept about the palace. When I attended the king after my recovery to return him thanks for his favors, he was pleased to rally me a good deal upon this adventure. He asked me what my thoughts and speculations were while I lay in the monkey's paw how I liked the victual, victuals he gave me, his manner of feeding, and whether the fresh air on the roof had sharpened my stomach. He desired to know what I would have done upon such an occasion in my own country. I told his majesty that in Europe we have no monkeys, except such as were brought for curiosity from other places, and so small that I could deal with a dozen of them together, if they presented to attack me. And as for that monstrous animal with whom I was so lately engaged, it was indeed as large as an elephant, if my fears had suffered me to think so far as to make use of my hanger, looking fiercely and clapping my hand on the hilt as I spoke, when he poked his paw into my chamber, perhaps I should have, should have given him such a wound as would have made him glad to withdraw it with, some, with more haste than he put it in. This I delivered in a firm tone, like a person who was jealous lest his courage be called into question. However, my speech produced nothing else beside a loud laughter, which all, which all the respect due to his majesty from those about him could not make them contain. This made me reflect how vain an attempt it is for a man to endeavor to do himself honor amongst those who are all out of degree of equality or comparison with him. And yet I have seen the moral of my own behavior very frequently in England since my return, where a little contemptual, contemptible varlet, without the least title to birth, person, wit, or common sense, shall presume to look with importance and put himself upon a foot with the greatest persons of the kingdom. I was every day furnishing the court with some ridiculous story, and Glumdoklitch, though she loved, loved me to excess, yet was arch enough to inform the queen whenever I committed any folly that she thought would be diverting to her majesty. The girl, who had been out of order, was carried by her governess to take the air about an hour's distance, or thirty miles from the town, 
They alighted out of the coach near a small footpath in a field, and Glumdeklitch setting down my travelling box, I went out of it to walk. There was a cow dung in the path, and I must needs try my, try my activity by attempting to leap over it. I took a run, but unfortunately jumped short, and found myself just in the middle up to my knees. I waded through with some difficulty, and one of the footmen wiped me as clean as he could with his handkerchief, for I was filthy, bemired, and my nurse confided to me and confined me to my box till we returned home, where the queen was soon informed of what had passed, and the footmen spread it about the court, so that all the mirth for some days was at my expense.'